Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all here remotely. My name is Melanie Strong, and I'm really excited to be interviewing um, someone that I admire greatly, and I think that you will as well once you hear a bit of her story. Um, a quick note about me. So I am an investor with Next Ventures, so I invest in the sports health and wellness space. So I'm very excited that part of this program that you all are participating in will be learning how to be a great investor. Um, I have the privilege of working with great founders in my day job. And then prior to founding Next Ventures, I worked at Nike for um, almost 20 years. So in the zone of the theme of uh, today's topic, talking about authenticity and purpose, which is uh, our two topics that are probably really important to you as founders and as mentors and investors. I am honored to be talking today to Karina LeBlanc. Um, a little bit about Karina. We're going to get into a pretty informal conversation, um, and hopefully you guys will enjoy this because we've been chatting and having a great time in preparation for this. Um, and Karina may not want to brag about all of her accomplishments, and yet they are pretty astounding. So Karina uh, played for Canada uh, on the national uh, women's national soccer team in five World Cups, uh, two Olympics, um, has had a lot of uh, feats and uh, accomplishments both on the pitch and off the pitch, more recently as uh, the head of women's for CONCACAF. And for those who are not familiar with the soccer or football space, as they call it in the rest of the world, CONCACAF is... Um, an organization that represents 41 different nations across Canada, the U.S., the Caribbean, and Central America, uh, supporting football efforts in those markets. And she'll tell you all a little bit more about that. Uh, but I'm excited to say hi to Karina and welcome her to the stage virtually. <laughs> um, and Karina, maybe you can just start with a little bit about um, where you are today <laughs> and what you are most excited to be sharing with this audience today. Well, thanks, Mel. Um, I think I'm most excited to be sharing in this conversation, first of all, with you, um, because I think from the, the conversation we've had, it's the realness that we've shown up in this conversation already. And I think for me, it's about showing up in life as my true authentic self and meeting people where they are. And when you actually connect with somebody on that immediately, I don't even know where this conversation is going to go, but so what I'm excited to write about in this moment is that this is not rehearsed. This is just us having a conversation and I hope out of it, you know, the people at home think and feel about themselves in the story and recognize the greatness that they have within them. So um, that's how I'm showing up um, where I am. Um, I'm in the Bahamas. Don't judge me on that. There's a story behind it that, you know, I'm always feel bad saying it, but you know, it's just an honor to be here on this this call and have this conversation with you. And wherever it goes, I know it's going to be something that I'm excited about, and I hope everyone's excited to listen to. I love that, and don't be embarrassed of being in the Bahamas. <laughs> I'm that was like really tough life. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm in Oregon, and it's not raining, so I'm happy that you're there. Well, we wanted to get right into it and talk a little bit about what it means to be connected to your purpose. And I understand and acknowledge that purpose is a word that's sort of lofty. I feel like you see more books every day in the self-help area of Amazon discussing what it means to live in alignment with your purpose. And yet I feel like you are someone who has always been connected to why you are here on this planet, why you have chosen the path you've chosen um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about when that sense of who you were and are and why you were here really came to light for you. Um, so funny story. I used to be the shyest kid in the world. Nobody ever believes that. I, uh, <laughs> exactly. And honestly, when every time everyone's like, no. And then if my mom's around, who's a loud Jamaican woman, you'll always hear her. She's like, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, I was the shyest kid in this world. You couldn't get me to speak. I was just, you couldn't even get me to leave my parents aside. Um, grew up in the Caribbean, a small island called Dominica. Uh, my mother's from Jamaica, not the Dominican Republic. And moved to Canada when I was eight. And I remember hating my parents when we moved because we went from comfortable to uncomfortable. And I was the only person of color in my school, um, stories that would just make you be like, that did not happen. Um, and I don't even blame 
people at the point because you only know what you know. And then I remember I got, I made my first friend because it's first, first day at school was horrible. I thought I made my first friend, put a firecracker in my hand. I remember falling to the, cr the ground and just crying and being like, why did you do this to us? And then made my first set of friends. And the next day they were going to soccer practice. And I remember going to soccer practice and my life changed. I was like, this is it. I was finally connected with like-minded people. And I went from the shyest kid in the world to telling the world um, I was going to be an Olympian. I was like, I'm going to go to the Olympics and play. Olympics. And people are like, what do you, what sport? And I'm like, I don't know. But I just was, I just saw these athletes being brave and bold and I wanted to be like them. And I remember um, one of my first moments of just reality is I tried it for the U15 um, BC team, which is a state team. And all of my friends made it. And I remember looking at the list and I was the only one not on the list and crying whole and being devastated. My mom was crying with me and my dad was like, Grr. and I'm like, dad, the worst, worst day of my life, what's going on? And he's like, what are you going to do about it? And, and early on, I learned that like I could control some of my outcomes. And the next year I did 15 minutes more every single day. And I bring this up because for everybody on this call right now, what is it that if you gave 15 minutes more of your time, would lead to a better version of yourself. And I learned that lesson at like 14. And it was one of those things where I learned that when I put 15 minutes more, you know, like what I wanted would happen and I'd lead to play like almost 18 years for my country. And I was always the last one signing autographs and whatnot. But I think for me, the turning point came when our head coach said to me, if you think your purpose on this earth is to kick a soccer ball for Canada, then I failed you. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm always the one last one signing autographs and doing all these things, but it led me to something bigger. And I say that because you always find what you're looking for. And I ended up, and it's, it's, it's a story where it's changed my life. I ended up um, speaking to different people. And I think this is what this call is about is trying to figure out with everyone's like, what is their purpose? Like what makes you feel alive? Like what makes you wake up in the morning and not hit that snooze button and be like, you know what? Like I'm, I'm put on this earth for something. And the world will tell you that no, you're not. But when you start to wake up and feel alive and seek that reason beyond what maybe other people think, but that makes that heartbeat go a bit more, then you're aligned to it. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like, what is he talking about? And I, I started seeking for something but I didn't know what it was and I remember being at an event and people paid a lot of money to sit at the table with the athletes and I was more curious of the people at my table and other athletes were on stage dancing and I'm like who are these people and I started being really really curious and the woman next to me um, ended up being the COO of UNICEF mm. and we went on and I would end up becoming an ambassador and my first trip I went to Honduras and I remember being terrified because I get out of the, the door and they're like, hey, um, just so you know, we've had 44 deaths tonight in the city. Um, mm. You'll have two gunmen outside of your hotel room door. I'm like, I'm from Canada. We leave our doors open. You know, like, what are you talking about? And it was one of those things because I was so terrified, but I was so open to the possibility. And I remember they had me lined up to do all these different things. And the first thing I did was a camp for 200 young girls, 13 and 14, some of them putting down their babies, right? And I remember being like, what? But again, you only know what you know. And they'd never seen me play in a World Cup or an Olympics. It was the fact that I showed up. And that's why I said, I, I just enjoy the fact that we're showing up in this conversation this way, because that moment would change my life. Coming, sprinting across the field, I'm like, what am I gonna do with all these girls? I'm like who's helping me? And they're like, here's some balls. And I'm jumping up and I see these five gray jerseys and they have holes in them. And I'm like, where'd you guys get those jerseys? And they're like, Miss LeBlanc, what's the problem? What's the problem? I'm like, um, where'd you get these jerseys? And they're like, it came from a Canadian years ago. What's the problem? Those gray jerseys were the first ever jerseys I'd played in at that sleepover in the club in a small town of Maple Ridge, BC. And it hit me. I was exactly what I was meant to be doing exactly what I was meant to be doing. Oh, wow. Now I tell that story because it changed my life because all of a sudden I was like, I want to impact and I want to use my story, which hasn't been the easiest. Cause I mean, we'd be here for 45 minutes if I just 
told you my story, but it was, it didn't happen to me because for any other reason that it was meant to help others. And I think the reason I say this on the call today, it's just every person on this call has their story. Every person on this call has a journey. Every person on this call has a greatness. Every person on this call is meant to impact. And whether it's to one, a million, five, it does not matter. But when you start seeking to understand why you were put on this earth and stay true to that and not listen to the world that tells you you should be average and no, when you start listening to that and that voice inside of you and already based on this call, you're understanding that that's when you start to align with your purpose on this earth. And it's right in front of you. Impact those right in front of you. Don't try to impact the world. Just impact those right around you. And uh, I don't know if that even answered your question. but no, it answered like 10 questions. That's great advice. All of it is great advice. So I think that the women who are here are here because they believe in themselves. I'm going to make that assumption. And I hope each one of you is watching and listening is nodding their heads like, yeah, I believe in myself. I know I can be successful. I know I have something really important to contribute to the world. And that's why I'm building, mentoring, investing, becoming a board member. And then sometimes we hold ourselves back. Mm. A lot of the time, a lot of systems outside of our control, control hold our, us back as well. But sometimes we hold ourselves back. And I can reflect on my own experience, having always felt like I didn't deserve to be where I was. I didn't have the pedigree to take a job at Nike. I didn't have the pedigree to be an investor. Um, I have always felt like I have had to prove myself, mm. even just to myself, to earn the right to be here. And I wonder if throughout your career, have you found yourself trying to be someone else, like trying to take on a certain personality, a mm. certain archetype, a certain way of showing up on your team or in your profession that you saw was working for other people that oh, yeah. you felt like might work for you. And what did you, how did you handle that? It's a beautiful question. Um, it's like 15 questions, but it's a beautiful, <laughs> I just say that because I'm like, every time I'm like, yeah, but I think it's, you got to come back to your why. And I mean, it's, it's a heavy question. It's people like, oh, start with the why. Oh my God. You know, but it, you have to understand and ask yourself, why was I put on this earth? It's, it's, it seems like a daunting question. And when you can come to that answer, then you can understand how to navigate through things. Because I, I would be lying to say, if I said, yeah, I always knew my why, or it took other people seeing in me what I didn't see in myself, as I just told you about my coach. It took me trying things and failing. Like I always said, dare to fail greatly. And that, that means dare to be the best version of yourself, but like take that leap and that chance that no one else is going to take other than you. Because at some point we need to start owning. And I know you said everyone here is confident and believes in themselves. Yes, but we also have to know that there's many times we don't. There's many times where, you know, you're seeking advice from everyone else. Tell me, tell me. And, it, you know, it's like that uncomfortable sitting in that uncomfortable space of like, what am I meant to learn here in my life that prepares me for the next level? And I'll say this, I'll give two stories. One with sport. Um, in 2011, our team came dead last at a World Cup. We'd given up our professional careers. We were supposed to finish top four, dead last. Remember walking off the field and reporters saying, how's it feel to let your country down? And you're like, hey, buddy, let's talk. Wow. Nine months later, we won a medal for our country and made history. And the coach who came in, new coach, new leadership, he asked us the most important question, what's your why? Right? My first Olympics went to win a medal, didn't win anything. Got pictures with like the stars, had lunch with Serena Williams, like all these things. Woo! Don't know where those pictures are. It was before iPhone days. <laughs> Second Olympics went to inspire the next generation. And why I say that is because when you start to connect on something bigger than yourself, which is your purpose, and it has to be about other people, you can do things bigger than you've ever done before. And all of a sudden, we're like vision clarity. Who is it that we wanted to be as a team, but as individuals, right? What was our legacy? What was our purpose? These heavy questions where you're like, 
And the outcome from that was walking that line every single day, we were going to be 80% plus of our best. And once we understood who we were, because we had this vision clarity of who I wanted to be on this earth, like Mel, who do you want to be on this earth? You know, like asking like who, if, if I ask people, what will they say about me? Hmm. And going through that cycle, we ended up winning a medal. And then me on a personal level, and I feel weird always talking about myself right now, but anyway, <laughs> Mia, because you're so awesome. I'm like, I no, want, no, like, every time I'm like, I want to ask you a question here, but then next time, my personal level, this pandemic, and I think everyone can connect to this, this pandemic has taught us some lessons about ourselves that we wanted to learn and some we didn't want to learn because it's that silence, that awkward silence. Yeah. And I gave birth to my beautiful baby girl, um, exactly the, the length of this pandemic. So I remember having that moment, whoa, best work, time of my life. And this is how I ended up in Bahamas because I wasn't supposed to give birth here. But mm -hmm. the doctor said, well, this COVID thing's happening. So um, you might want to stay. And gave birth, joy of our lives. And within a week, I would have heart failure. And um, I remember waking my husband up, couldn't breathe, and being like, I can't breathe, calling the doctor and the doctor saying, you need, you need to get to the hospital right now. Um, you don't have time for an ambulance. And it had been locked down here, so there was nobody on the street. You had to call ahead and get into the hospital. The same hospital had been in a week before. All of a sudden, my husband can't come in. My child can't come in. I, the whole ride, she'd been holding my hand. Oh. just like that. And I said the goodbye speech. And I remember saying, Hey God, if you give me more time, I promise to make it ha matter. Like just, just give me time and get into the hospital going in. And I, I can tell you what I, what it feels like to, to not think you're going to make it and tears running down my eyes as they're trying to do scans and just being like, this is it. And then making it through it. So those three days were terrifying. I have a newborn, I'm separated from her. And then the doctor's coming in and saying, you know what, you're gonna get to go home. And I'm like, couldn't be more excited. <laughs> but then the doctor who had greeted me at the hospital had the virus and sadly died. And so all of a sudden I'd been exposed and they're like, you're gonna get to go, but you have to spend two weeks in quarantine away from your newborn daughter. This is my only child. And I'll tell you, those two weeks were hard. And the reason I'm saying the story is because in those two weeks, I had to pause. And I asked myself, what lesson am I meant to learn that I have not learned yet? Because I feel like this is so personal, I had to stop. And I realized, first of all, how powerful we are as human beings, how strong we are as women, how there's something bigger. And I realized that if we can get through our greatest moments of pain and sorrow and hurt and pause and reflect, that's going to prepare us for the next level of our greatness. And it's through that pain and that pit that I talked about as an athlete that prepared me for those two weeks of literally being on my own and, you know, seeing my daughter. If you can see, there's a little glass line in that thing. That was the only way I got to see her. Oh my God. And it was the hardest thing, but I'll tell you, I'm a better woman for it because I think we all have gone through this pandemic and we all have our moment. My daughter's name is Paris, but we all have our Paris at the end of our most difficult times. And if we can hang on to the fact that it hurts and it's personal, but we're meant to grow and we're meant to understand our greatness and we're meant to understand what we're put on this earth to be. When you get through that and you own it and don't play victim or blame. And I'm not, I'm not saying that people aren't in that space, but just own it and be like, you know what? This isn't happening to me, but for me, because I can get to that best, best level of myself. I think that's when you start to live in this world of alignment to your purpose and your why. So if you're going through something right now, just understand it's uncomfortable, but that discomfort's going to lead you to that comfortable space of being in alignment with who you're meant to be on this earth. You felt so aligned with your purpose before you almost died. Having gone through that experience, understanding how to process in whatever time you had to process the fact that you may never see Paris again, your husband again, 
do the work that you already felt you were on this earth to do. Were there decisions that you made immediately, even then with this new learning of your own mortality, of your own humility, of our own fragility as human beings? Were there decisions you made when you did get back home, when you realized you were COVID free and healthy and could hold your daughter again? Like, did you make any immediate life decisions then because of that new learning? I think the decisions I made then and now is, I ask myself every day, does this align to my purpose on this earth? And those are the decisions I make. Because I think we spend so much time fixated on things that don't matter. (laughs) And we're, we, we take on things that are not meant for us to take on, you know, like personalizing, you know, whether something that happens at work or somebody in somebody's life and we're like, oh, that, no, it wasn't personal. They're going and respecting people are going through what they're going through. But for me, the, the yeses and the nos come down to, is this going to help me be the put person I was put on this earth to be? Or is it not? This is this, this align to the person I was put on this earth to be or not? Like, it's simple. Like, this conversation, easy yes. It aligns with the person I was put on this earth to be. And it's not meant to come across any way other than, like, I'm living my why, right? And then that's what I want to challenge everybody on this call is to ask yourself. And if you can't find it, it's not an easy, like, oh, okay, that's the answer. I need to be doing that every day. (laughs) It's start to shape your life around what makes you feel alive? And I mean alive, like you're living life. You don't want to hit snooze in the morning, you know, like the rain outside. You still want to get out there and enjoy it. Like the people around you start. That's some of the things too. I started to get rid of some of the people around me because I think the reality is that some of the people around me, even though they had the best of intentions, were pulling me away from who I was meant to be. And it just, and especially in those two weeks, because I did not end up having COVID, but again, it's like at that time you don't know. And you're like, I'm just going to do what's best for my daughter. But during those two weeks, I couldn't get my high high blood pressure up. So you start to realize that like, who's actually there in your life trying to help you be better and show up in whatever way you need versus the way they think you need. And the people who are showing up in the ways that they, I, they thought that they were helping me that I'm like, no, I'm trying to communicate. It just, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's a hard thing is we need to start to understand that we're a reflection of the five people we spend most of our time with, right? Absolutely. And so in this virtual space or you're spending time given energy, sometimes I think when you're trying to find your purpose on this earth, it's being very smart about who you're letting enter that headspace. Because mm-hmm. I'm telling you, the world will pull you away from your reason here on this earth, because the world, and we were talking about this earlier, like as an athlete, when you retire, it's like your first death, right? And you don't, you're like, who am I in this world? And it's the people that are feeding that stuff to you who makes you start to believe who you are. And I think just be mindful of what, what is it that you're telling yourself and what is other people telling you about yourself as you go on this beautiful journey of finding out who you're meant to be on this earth and, and, and really ask yourself, am I really living that? The power of the people that you surround yourself with is really important. One of the things that I learned in this new chapter of my career as an investor is that there is this crazy power shift that happens where investors like myself don't exist without great founders to invest in. Mm-hmm. This is a truth. It's the reason why this space exists at all. And yet, one of my observations and surprises coming into this space was that the energy, the language we use around fundraising, the ways in which investors and founders interact favors the investor. So the, the power, the influence, the access to capital, which is really the only thing investors have. We have funds that you need as a startup founder to get your idea and your purpose off the ground. And then I meet founders later who wish they had understood the power they actually do have in that moment of saying yes or no to an investor and that they would have thought differently about who they were inviting into their company. You're essentially inviting someone onto your cap table, inviting them to own 
part of your company. Um, and when you're an early stage founder, every dollar seems really valuable. Mm -hmm. How can you say no to someone who wants to give you money? Ideally, it's because they believe in you and believe in what you're building. But that money may also come with other things that you didn't spend the time to think about. Mm -hmm. So how can you make sure that even when you're raising your first round, when you're, an, you know, you're getting angel friends and family money to help prove that you have something that could contribute positively to the world and help your investors hopefully make money, like it's really hard to remember that you can say no to the people that come with that money because they may not deserve to be there with you at that moment. And I think it's important for people to hear your story and the power of the relationships that you invited into your life and didn't invite um, because of your understanding that they reflected who you were and that could be they could be there to help you further align your life against your purpose or take you further away from that purpose. And so I just wanted to like pause on that for a moment because that is something that as an investor still puzzles me that there is this odd power that the VCs and the institutional investors have over founders that should not be there. So if you're a founder, please remember that it is an honor and a privilege for an investor to invest in you and invest in the company that you are building and say no to the people who don't deserve to be there and trust your instincts because the superpower we have as women mm -hmm. is understanding intentions and understanding the person behind that money and do mm. that work. I think that that's like a really important takeaway for me, frankly, from this conversation. The second one was around mistakes and failures. I know you're really passionate about this and so am I. Like we learn a lot more from our failures than we do from our wins. Is there something maybe in this most current chapter of your life, like the transition from pro athlete to leader in the sports space, like you're creating the playbook by which the next Karina is going to be <laughs> progressing her career. Are there things that you would have done differently? Are there mistakes that you see happening in this space that we can think about as women who want to continue to progress this path and this space forward? Um, I think so to what would I have done differently? Um, it's not that I got it right. <laughs> Right. Um, like I said before, dare to fail greatly. That's what I did as an athlete. And when you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think that's when you're starting to push to that next level. I would say this to like, I, I, like I said, I have a new daughter, so that adds to my why, you know, mm -hmm. for everything I do, I'm like, is this making the future better for her? I think all of us need to own our space confidently own our space own your story own your life own your struggles um because i guess it's an interesting question of what would i do differently i don't even like i don't i don't think of where i failed as something against me because i've seen life come full circle and i was like man that was a beautiful lesson i <laughs> hated learning that lesson but and it was beautiful because i think when we start to think bigger picture and again think of why we were put on this earth, you realize it's not going to be a smooth trail. Mm -hmm. And in every thing that has happened, there's a powerful lesson to be learned. And I'd say to everybody on this call is own your failures, put your hand up. I think that's, that's something that's not too many times. It was like, Oh, it wasn't me, but, but then you're missing it. Right. Own your failures. As you said, make them your success. But like, I don't know. I, I just feel like, one of the greatest lessons I've learned in, in now helping be a part of leading 41 countries is that everybody has a different story and they take and they learn and they absorb differently. And it, it, um, it's, it's, it's just interesting. It's hard to put into words. It's just interesting to know the space that everyone's in. And, and I feel like take a step back and listen and learn a bit more, you know, because I think I've learned a lot of things, but one of the things I've also learned is that I don't know everything. And anybody can teach you a lesson, mm -hmm. right? And you can at any point impact somebody's life for the better. You know, I mean, something as simple as going to Starbucks, paying for somebody's coffee. You never know the impact of that. But I would just say like to everyone on this call, I know time is ending soon. Um, my lessons I've learned is that we need to celebrate ourselves 
we need to be able to say to ourselves in the mirror, I am enough. Mm. I know, I know for me, that was hard and people are like, what do you mean? And I still am sitting here thinking I haven't done enough in this world. And my husband shakes my head on it, but I think acknowledging that we are enough where we are, but we still want to go so much further is important, you know? And I, I'm not, I don't know if I answer that question because I, I'm stumped because I'm like, I feel like I should have regrets. And it's not that I don't have regrets. I just, I just can't look at the negative and live in the negative. I, I somehow in my brain find a way to shift it as an opportunity of growth and learning. And it's going to make me a better version of myself moving forward in the future. That's been a magical answer. <laughs> You turn those tough moments into lessons, which make something that could be negative into something positive. Like, I think that's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Um, thank you for being so true to who you are here. I knew you would be because I know you and I'm so grateful <laughs> that I got to be here with We're you. We're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck with me for life. Um, Karina, I wanted to thank you on behalf of Female Founders Alliance for being here. Um, this couldn't have started the next two days in a better and more positive and more energizing way. We are going to be rooting for you because I happen to know firsthand you are going to be contributing positively to change. And I want to watch that and advocate for that and just, yeah, do all I can to support you in that effort. And hopefully this can be a place where we can do that for each other. So thank you on behalf of everyone here and hopefully we'll get to celebrate your upcoming win soon. Well, Mel, thanks for having me. Thanks for interviewing me. Thanks for inspiring me in this conversation. I think a lot of people will walk away feel inspired by your words as well. And may I challenge everyone on this call for the next 48 hours of your life, live it purposefully. And I mean in every way, shape or form in your relationships, be purposeful in your work, be purposeful in your walk, be purposeful, but just try to be purposeful of the reason you were put on this earth for the next 48 hours and see where that takes you. Done. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks Mel. <laughs> <laughs>